In this episode, we'll be talking about how we can use the quirks of human decision making. What if we got it all wrong about experience design? And finally, how we can help teams to solve problems in less time. If you're interested in that, keep watching. And here's the guest for this episode. Hey, I'm Luke, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi guys, my name is Mark Fontijn and welcome to the Service Design Show. If you're trying to design services that have a positive impact on people's lives and are good for business, then you've come to the right place. Because here on this channel, you get a chance to learn the real reasons why some services fail and others succeed. For that, we go beyond the usual tools and methods and deep dive into topics like design thinking, customer experience, organizational change, and creative leadership. If you're interested in these topics, now that we bring a new video every week, so if you don't want to miss anything, subscribe to the channel. My guest in this episode is Luke Betty. Luke is the founder of Sprint Valley, which is a studio that helps organizations use psychology, to create better products and services. And recently Luke finished a year long research project on how fast food brands use behavioral economics to shift buying behavior using menu design. In the next 30 minutes, we'll be talking about how we can use the weird quirks of human decision making. We'll be talking about what if we got it all wrong about experience design. And finally, how can we help teams to solve problems in less time? So that was it for the introduction, and now let's jump straight into the interview with Luke. Welcome to the show, Luke. Good to be here, Mark. Um, Luke, awesome to have you on the show, because the, we're going to talk about topics that haven't been on the uh, show uh, that often. And um, we're going to talk a lot about psychology. But let me start with the first question I ask everyone, and that is, you know, do you remember you, your first encounter with service design? Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, I, so I've been in sort of, I guess, the marketing world for 10, 12 years, something like that. And um, I grew increasingly frustrated with the agencies that I was in. And they were coming up with all these kind of crazy, weird and wonderful ways to reinvent a client's business. And, you know, it all sounded really exciting, but I think, Certainly over the last five or six years, what we found is that the briefs we were working on were changing, right? We were going from dealing with a marketing department to all of a sudden dealing with IT or HR or operations or finance. And all of a sudden you needed to um, understand how that crazy idea was going to play out internally across all of those different business units. And I felt like... I guess because I've, I've tended to work in smaller businesses, there's been a lot of sort of self-learning. I'm very much kind of self-taught. And I guess I, I just felt like I needed some kind of framework, something substantial to kind of structure the way that we were approaching these different problems. And I think at the time I probably would have been researching, uh, you know, customer experience design mm. or customer experience frameworks or, or that kind of thing. And I ended up getting introduced to Lego Serious Play. And um, yep. kind of thought, okay, this is great. So learn how you know Lego kind of run their innovation process, and went and went and, and did that, and um, you know really fell in love with this whole, I'll call it design thinking, but this um, way of helping teams come together to problem solve. And uh, then got introduced to uh, the, the magic black book. Yeah, the black. And do you know what? Do you know what made me feel like ah, oh, this is where I need to be when I got this. Was it's like it's a textbook, right? So it's not like somebody who's run a business and then just you know wants to share their expertise. You know, it felt academic and it felt um, I don't know, it felt really robust. And I yeah, from there just started exploring other agencies and yeah, you know, yeah. thirty one volts and you know IDO yeah. and uh, AJ and Smart and all those guys and just immerse myself. And I suppose I'd probably been doing service design for a long time but hadn't known it was called that and yeah just you know just felt something kind of we've heard a lot on, on yeah, the show <laughs> i guess because it touches so many different things you know so many components and parts that you yeah. have expertise in i think everybody's in it in some level if your business delivers a service so absolutely yeah it's, it's been even said uh, i think mauricio mania said every company is doing service design yeah by definition so either either they do it consciously or by accident yeah absolutely 
let's dive into the topics you've sent me because they will be uh, super interesting, I guess. Ooh. We're going to co-create the questions. Uh, you know the format. You've got the question starters. I've got your topics. Uh, so are you ready? Let's do it. All right. Topic number one. Uh, topic number one is called decision making. Okay. So, which uh, question started will you pick? Okay, so my question is how can we take advantage of all of the weird and wonderful quirks of human decision making? Um, so, I'm going to kind of, I don't know how many people are sort of familiar with uh, frameworks like uh, Kahneman's System 1, System 2. So, I'm just going to do like a quick primer. So that sure, go ahead. So, yeah. Um, you know, Danny Kahneman wrote a book a little while back called Thinking Fast and Slow, and the nuts and bolts of that is that your brain is comprised of these two different systems. So you've got system one, which is fast, it's automatic, uh, it's low energy, it's instinctive. So if I was going to say to you, Mark, do you prefer dogs or cats, what would you say? I would say cats. There you go, right? Like no energy at all required to answer that. So I'm going to show you something now that's kind of weird, though. Can you see that okay? I think so, yeah. Okay, so I want you now just to imagine that you've landed on an alien planet, and I want you to tell me which of these organisms is called Kiki, and which one is called Booba. Is it the I would one? Say, yeah, the people who are listening to the podcast, you need to watch the episode. I would say Booba is the one with the rounded edges. Okay, and Kiki is the one with the sharp edges. Yeah. Okay, so let's just stop there for a second. Was that difficult to answer? Not at all. How is it that you can answer a question with no logic whatsoever that easily? Like, I just find it absolutely fascinating. Uh, do you, I mean, do you have any thoughts on like how you, how you were able, there's no logic to that, so how do you think you maybe were able to The only thing I could say is that it's based on your, uh, the experience you've had in the past. So it's like conditioning your brain, something like that? Yeah, kind of, kind of. It's actually, it's actually a little bit weirder than that. So um, uh, like 99% of the people across the world make the same uh, response. So they say that the spiky one is Kiki. And then mm. if some people think maybe that's because like the, uh, the, the letter K, maybe that's got sharp edges, but they've actually tried it with, with uh, communities that don't use the Roman alphabet at all. So it's nothing to do with the shape of the letter. Actually, what they say it's to do with is when you say the word kiki in your mind, even if you're not saying it out loud, you activate all the same muscles that you use to say that word. So when you say kiki, you actually bare your teeth slightly. And the idea is that that triggers off concepts around biting. That triggers off other concepts around sharp. And therefore, we're able to use that to try and answer the question about which one feels like a spiky sounding word or a soft Sounding yeah. Weird. And I just, yeah. you know, it blows my mind. You know, it's like what our body's doing there is using system one. It's saying, hey, there's no rational way to answer this question. I'm going to dive in and just use whatever data I can to try and form an opinion. And the flip side of that would be system two. So if I said to you, what's 9.24 times 13.32, like, yeah, that that kind of uh, feeling of mental effort is is system two. And I think what what we find generally when we're working with people is clients usually accidentally are trying to get their customers to make a system two decision. And our job is to try and find ways to make more of that feel like a, a system one decision. Um, and there's some, I don't know, I guess I just feel like there are some really interesting peculiarities that come out of this system one, system two thing. So, you know, take the example of, you know, within a service experience, how do I decide whether, um, you know, a price feels good value or not? That's like quite a system two decision to make, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, give you an example of that, you know, when Apple launched the iWatch, um, they had a real challenge. They were bringing a brand new kind of category to life essentially. And as a consumer, how do I decide whether the pricing on that product feels like good value? I don't really have a benchmark to play against. And their solution you'll probably remember was to tell everybody that, well, it could cost as much as $17,000 at the at the top end. And this is a, a really interesting one because what it does is it, it frames that bottom end price of $349. And it's a concept called anchoring. You know, a lot of people are, are familiar with that, that 
the first piece of information that we get creates a lens that affects the way that we view all subsequent information. And I just think there's some really fascinating, uh, exciting ways that that can, that can play out. There's other things that happen as well. So um, another rule of thumb might be that um, they're called heuristics. Another heuristic could be that uh, numbers with more syllables are bigger. Now that's true if you're talking in the billions, but if we were gonna take a price like 56 pounds 99, that's seven syllables. If I actually increase that price to 56 pounds, that's got four syllables. Actually, even though it's a higher price because there's less syllables, we'll feel that the number is easier to process and mm. it will feel mm. smaller. And we've run experiments where we've improved sales like 15, 16% just by increasing the price just a little bit to change the number of syllables in the- That's scary. Yeah, well, it is, but I think it, you know, I see all of these things like paints, right? You know, when you're being creative and you're thinking about building a service experience or designing a product, these are all things that you need to have an awareness of to make sure that you're making the experience as, as, as kind of powerful, both for the customer and, you know, ultimately for the business as, as possible. So, yeah, I, yeah, for me, that this whole area about how we make decisions, I think, yeah, I think it's just really fascinating. And you've already uh, gave an example of how this, uh, applies to services, but what are some common examples that you think of how the service design community could benefit of this? Because pricing is, of course, sure. Yeah, so pricing is one thing. So, um, albeit you know, obviously an important one. But okay, let's take another example. So, there's a guy called Charles Spence at Oxford University, and he does a load of work on how um, certain sensory information triggers other sensory uh, kind of perceptions. And I'll explain, I'll explain an example. So he ran an experiment in a restaurant where he gave um, all the different diners different weight cutlery. And after their meal, he asked them um, to just give some scores and some ratings on the quality of the food. And what he found was that diners who had heavier cutlery tended to rate the food as being higher quality the diners who had lighter cutlery. And so um, I guess this is the idea that we've learned over time that generally heavier stuff tends to be more valuable material. And, and but because of that, it's doing this, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's essentially creating this lens that we use to interpret the experience that we've had. Yeah, another example would be uh, you know, a, a great experiment where they had a bunch of people coming in for an interview and the person that they met on the door greeting them to the building, they escorted them up to the interview in the lift. And while they're in, while they're in the lift, half the people, the lady said to them, hey, could you just hold my cup of coffee for a moment while I get something in my bag? Um, took the coffee back, carried on through. Anyway, after their interview, they brought them back and they said, hey, look, we want to know more about how we can improve the experience for people coming for interview. And um, just wanted to know, um, how would you describe the personality of the person that met you? And they found that the people that were holding the warm cup of coffee tended to describe the person as having a warm personality. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, you know, it makes sense to start thinking about um, not just about how do you activate people's expectations of what's going to happen next in an experience as a lens, but how might you activate um, like the mindset that you would want them to have? You know, if a customer's got a problem solve or has to be quite visionary and imagining a future outcome, what could you do to, uh, yeah, kind of make that more likely to happen by activating a concept? So, yeah, I just... This whole area for me, I just think is, uh, you know, really, really exciting. And the, the interesting question for me becomes, um, uh, at, at, at what, the word authenticity, you know, I, yeah, right? At, at, at which moment do you actually deliver a better experience versus experiencing a better experience? But look, we, we, we got to move on. So maybe, sure. uh, maybe we'll touch upon that uh, later in the, uh, in the episode. But for now, let's leave it up uh, for this for this topic one and move over to topic number two. Cool. Right? That's good. All right. <clears throat> this one is just as interesting, I guess, as the previous one, and it's called memory formation. Okay. So do you have a question starter? Yeah, totally. So uh, my question is, what if we've got it all wrong about experience design? So, so that's a quite interesting question. Yeah, so uh, I've seen, I think a couple of your guests have touched on this, but you know, maybe I can sort of help pad some of this out a little bit. So, um, 
you know, if I was going to ask you uh, where your perfect holiday would be, where would you say? Like, I would say, it de yeah, it depends. <laughs> sure, like a, a location, like a, like the dream holiday. Like a lot of people might say, like on the beach or yeah, whatever. yeah. But if you were then going to think about the the kind of situation where you couldn't leave that holiday with a memory of it, you know, would you really choose the same place? And mm. and it's this concept of the you know, you have the experiencing self and the experiencing self is concerned with this 300 millisecond window of reality called now. And then you've got the remembering self and the remembering self's job is to tell stories about what's happened and what's going to happen. And I think so much of the rhetoric in service design or in design thinking is really focused on improving the experience, the now, how it feels in the moment. And actually, I think what a lot of the research suggests is there might be a sort of a shortcut to that because ultimately it's not the experiencing self that's deciding whether or not they're going to come back and spend money with you again. It's definitely not the experiencing self that's deciding whether they want to recommend you to friends. It's the remembering self. And right, there's a right. way that you can design services and experiences to optimize for people's memory of the experience that ultimately is as important as making the experience feel good in the yeah. So this is this kind of concept of, of peak end. So, uh, yeah. you know, you've kind of heard about it before, right? You know, Absolutely. when we yeah. build our service maps, it's all about those individual discrete chapters in the journey and we optimize for those. But the reality is when it comes to remembering, we think about the biggest departure from our, expe our, our, ex our uh, expectation, positive or negative, and how that chapter ended. And we sort of, we form uh, our memory based on those two data points. And I, um, I'll give you a I'll give you an example of I think a brand sure. done this really really well. So uh, a few years ago, I went to a, a restaurant called the Fat Duck in Bray by a guy called Heston Blumenthal, really creative mm, chef. Mm. Um, and people often ask, you know, what was the kind of the standout experience of that? And you know, we arrived at twelve thirty five when we were told we got greeted by name. Felt great, but obviously nobody else was arriving at that particular time. So it's you know. Simple, simple service magic, if you like. The food was great, but the expectation is already pretty high for that. Um, they ended really strong. They gave us a nice little signed card. So, so that was great. But actually, the biggest departure from my experience or sort of my, uh, my expectation was the 45 minutes that you spend on hold trying to book the restaurant. And what they did was they actually played somebody narrating Alice in Wonderland down the phone while you're waiting on hold. So by the time somebody picks up the phone 45 minutes in, you're actually kind of annoyed that they're breaking at like a really. <laughs> and I just, you know, I love that because it's this idea of finding something that's just mundane. And it's almost, um, I'd say, those mundane parts of people's expectations, the experience those are the places where you can have a lot of fun and actually probably shape quite a lot of memories. So, um, yeah, mm. I, I, yeah, personally, I just, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. So, uh, so what's needed to be aware as a designer of these moments? How, how, how do we tune ourselves into yeah, being more aware? So I think what I'd say is, um, I think you need to be quite conscientious about how you're designing your peak and your end moment. So mm. normally what we would do is take sort of a whole service journey and break them up into, we would just call them chapters. So a chapter might be, um, you know, I don't know, your first purchase as, a, as an example. And then thinking about mapping what's the expectation line throughout that experience. And then thinking, look, where are the points where expectation are either negative or low? And is there anything that we could do here that would just kind of flick the needle on that? So I suppose in answer to your question, it's be intentional about where you want the peak moment to be and play around yeah. how you could create that and just make sure that every chapter has a strong ending. And if you can work on those two parts of that, that moment, I'd say those are really the first bits to, to really consider. Mm -hmm. I, I think two people that pop into my mind who talked about this is, um, Adam Lawrence, who of course talked about the dramatic structure and yeah. the storytelling and yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, yeah. the whole theater uh, experience, yeah. how that's designed. And in a quite recent episode, Cheryl Lee Ryan touched upon the uh, remember designing for the remembering self, yeah. right? That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good episode. Um, what are the things that puzzle you regarding this topic? What questions do you have when you think about memory formation? <sighs> Probably or what it, the mo most important question. 
the most important question uh, in terms of kind of memory formation. Hmm. Uh, probably, how do you think about using? It, it's actually probably how do you make sure you end strong at each chapter? I think that's the most challenging part. You know, it's hmm. it's hmm. easy to find those areas where um, you know expectation is really low, but trying to find those moments where you can end a particular chapter in a particularly positive way certainly where you're doing something more transactional without it being kind of just gimmicky for the sake of it. I think it's, uh, I think it's actually really, really complex and, and just takes a lot of trial and error to, to get right. So, yeah. It's it would be interesting if people uh, who are watching or listening uh, this episode would leave some comments, you know, from examples, case studies, in which uh, see. That, that they see these things because I, I really... I have a lot of uh, projects that go through my mind right now, you know, with uh, how the ending could be even more uh, positive. We're moving on. We're moving on to topic number three. And topic number three is, and there we go. It's called problem solving in group dynamics. Luke, Luke is gone. Sorry, it's picking up. Ah, there, there's Luke again. Uh, okay, so my question is, um, you know, how can we help teams solve problems in less time? Um, That's what we all want. Which is what we all want and we're all expected to do at, at increasing speed. Um, so I, I, I'm kind of throwing experiments at you here. I hope you don't worry. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. But so there was, Go ahead. Th th there's a guy called uh, Ash in the 1950s in the States, and he ran an experiment around conformity where he brings a bunch of people into a room and you're invited in. And what he's going to show you on the wall is a whole bunch of lines that are different lengths. And the task is pretty simple. You've got to tell him which of these lines is the same length as this one. Um, and what you don't know is that everybody else in the room is actually in the experiment as well. And then mm -hmm. they're going to say the wrong answer and see how you react. Um, what they found is that on the first uh, question, you'll answer as you think, you'll give the right answer. Um, but on the second answer, when you see everybody else answering differently, people tend to just kind of go with the group. And um, you know, I find it it's, it's quite incredible when you watch some of the footage of these experiments because you can literally see the person totally confused why the group are answering wrong, but they still, you know, they still go along with it anyway. And so... Um, I guess I'm really interested in how things like hierarchy affect how teams work. So this concept of the, you know, the 80-20 uh, workshop or 80-20 meeting where 80% of the contribution comes out of 20% of the people in the room and people don't speak up because they're afraid of what their boss is going to think or mm. don't think their mm. idea is good enough. And I think when I got into the whole service design world, I started understanding why a lot of the methods work, you know, from a psychological perspective, you know, the concept of asking a question to a room, getting people to work on their solution in isolation, and then reporting back as a, as a, a really simple way of getting around that conformity piece, I just think is, I think is re yeah. really beautiful, you know, really, really, really smart. That, that was the question that was uh, uh, playing through my head is, you know, what does this mean for co-creation that we hold so dear in, in our field, right? Uh, well, well I, think, I think the answer is you, without, maybe without knowing it, you're, you're kind of applying the psychology in a really, in a really creative way. It's, you know, if it's a problem to solve, don't ask the group to solve it together. Get everyone yeah. working in isolation and, and come back. And, you know, it's that when, when groups come together, it t you tend to get convergent thinking and a certain part of the problem solving, you know, you, you, need, you need divergent thinking. So, um, yeah, don't let people talk about it too much. We, we had a guest on one of the previous episodes, Elaine, and I think, and she was talking about co-creation in uh, the Asian culture, uh, in China specifically, and she said that they had to redesign some of the service design methods to actually fit in, uh, in the culture. For instance, she gave an example of what they uh, called as a method, the anonymous post-it. So everyone could, up, could put up ideas that would be thrown in a big hat and nobody would know who formulated the idea to get around the hierarchies and stuff like that. Yeah, that's yeah, really interesting. I, I do wonder whether they use things like, oh, how successful things like Lego Series Play or yeah, some of the other methods might be in, uh, you know, in some of those cultures. I'm sure they, I'm sure they work. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, again, with Lego Series Play would be also quite challenging because you're on stage designing your 
uh, things, right? It's true, yeah, very true, very true. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the anonymity is maybe important, yeah. And uh, have you found that this is specifically um, uh, related to problem solving or is this, um, do you see any difference uh, if you look at this from, um, I don't know, ideation or research phase? Um, yeah, so, so I think, um, I think the convergent thinking part, working on problems in isolation and then reporting back, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because that, that, that early ideation phase is really important. I think the other thing is, you know, Parkinson's law is that the task that you have fills the time that you have. So mm -hmm. um, this idea that I just loved from, you know, the design sprint methodology around time boxing and actually just give people less time than they really feel they need on certain parts of the problem solving because do you know what? You'll make progress. It might not be perfect. It might not be comfortable, but actually you'll sort of force the team through some of that um, deliberation. Uh, mm -hmm. I, think is, I think it's also really, really important. And I think the other thing that I'm really interested in, and I haven't, I haven't quite cracked, is like mindset. So I've sort of mentioned earlier about how you activate mindsets. And there have been experiments that have shown that, you know, you show people uh, – the Apple logo and then show people the Windows logo and ask them to kind of work on a creative task. Generally, the people that have seen the Apple logo will come up with a higher volume of ideas. I know it's really stupid, but it's just because people have the mindset of being more creative mm. and that kind of for whatever reason helps unblock that. I do think that it would be really interesting to think about a, a product or a service that systematically gets people into the right kinds of mindsets for kind of workshops, but may, and maybe that's for a, a future project. But I think there's definitely something there. I think there's definitely something there. I'm thinking about athletes, you know, they, they have a sort of ritual to get in a sort of specific mind, mind state, yeah. right? No, mindset, I, I, mindset. You know, I, and I do the same thing. So it's the whole conditioning piece. So if I've got like a, a piece of work that requires real focused thought, I always drink Earl Grey and I will always listen to classical music it's only only when I'm doing that particular piece of work so that yeah. I know the next yeah. time I've got to come into it if I can complete that ritual I'll kind of get in that in that mindset more but I just wonder how you could help teams do the same do the same thing hmm. look um, as everyone else uh, on the show you're getting the opportunity to ask a question to the people who are listening or watching this episode is there something you'd like to ask us yeah, it's a bit of a big question. Is that okay? No, go ahead. All right. Okay. So, um, so we're doing some work at the moment around sort of the future of work. And uh, in five years' time, you're going to be able to buy for $1,000 a handheld device that's got the same computing power as a human brain. Like we're five years away from that. The UK government are currently predicting that by 2030, unemployment will reach 40 to 50%. Okay, so this is automation and the rest of it. Really big stuff and really not very far away. And um, I'm really interested in what that's going to feel like, you know, when you've got half the population unemployed. In reality, it's going to be universal basic income. So they're not going to need to get a job. I would love to know if anybody else is interested in that problem and if they've done any thinking on it. And also, what kind of services and products are we going to need in a world where you don't need to work anymore. That that kind of pressure isn't isn't really there. I think that's just a, a pressing, interesting, complicated problem. Uh -huh. so if anyone's got any thoughts, yeah, definitely, definitely get in touch. I'd love to hear what you've got, what you're thinking. And and I guess if this is your mindset, then uh, you make you definitely make different decisions in your design process, right? Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right? That when that that kind of money constraint piece is removed mm. i think there's a whole bunch of other stuff that becomes important about you know your sense of self when that becomes uncoupled from what you earn and what your job is boy we're going to think differently about how we make decisions and how we fill our time and yeah what kind of things and tools and experiences we want to achieve whatever goals we're going to have in that world so yeah yeah so i would love to know what people think about that any, uh, as a final question, you know, if people are uh, interested in learning more about the topics we talked about, what kind of resources would you recommend? What are some of the go-to things? Uh, so I'm actually finding that there are some amazing Facebook groups at the moment hmm. on this. So a um, few different places. So behavioraleconomics.com is great. Um, I would try reading thinking fast and slow it's not a very interesting read the daniel kahneman one it's it's a bit heavy going but there's some really great videos and ted talks about it so i definitely i would definitely start there 
Um, but then there are some, yeah, maybe I'll share some links in terms of some of the Facebook sure. groups to be relevant. Yeah, we'll add them to the, uh, to the... It's a happy sharing knowledge and yeah, good ones to try out. So what is your biggest insight from this episode? Let me know down below in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you give a thumbs up. And if you know someone who might benefit from what we've just discussed, share this video with them. If you'd like to learn more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we talk about on the show. Thanks again for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.